Thank you. Hey, We're going over here. How's everyone doing today? I want to make sure you guys. Thank you. Um, Thank you. My name is Steve Weintraub. I run a website called Collider. Uh, we sometimes have five, six readers a month. We're doing OK. And Anyway, uh, I cover primarily movies. I've been doing this for like 10 years, and thank you for having me uh, moderate. Um, right here is Roy Lee, Adrian Iscaria. Uh, why don't you guys give a little bit of background for people that aren't familiar with uh, your work? Do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, my name is Roy, and uh, I have recently produced movies like The Lego Movie and uh, upcoming movies like the Minecraft movie and Dungeons and Dragons, but uh, I got my start with uh, doing horror movies with uh, The Ring and The Grudge and other type of thrillers like The Departed and uh, like an animated movie with How to Train Your Dragon. And uh, I just, I've just been working with the studio through the studio system for the past 20 years. That's all? Uh, Adrian Iscaria, my company is called Prime Universe Films. My claim to fame... Uh, uh, seems to be taking video games and developing them and sometimes getting them made. My last uh, project was Hitman Agent 47, which Fox put out last summer, and uh, working on a number of other video game-based uh, movies and coupled with this guy right here. Uh, since I started covering movies about a decade ago, uh, the industry has shifted from being scared of websites to actively embracing them. With I've been on set visits, I've exclusive interviews. For the two of you, since you got involved in Hollywood, how has it changed? Uh, Roy, do you want to start? Yeah, at first it was like the studios were very afraid of any information being out there and like they would try to stop any type of information being disseminated at all. But now it's like we invite people to the set, we talk to each other, but we do have to clear everything through the studio before we actually give any relevant information about the projects we work on. You know, with regard to the, uh, the website and social media? Well, or? And just also making movies. But well, well, let's well. do with the... <laughs> that's uh, you know, uh, the first part, what he said, uh, but, uh, you know, with regard to films themselves, you know, the 12, 13 year, odd years I've been in the business as a, in this side of it, uh, I think uh, dramatically, I think, you know, uh, less movies are getting made at major studios, harder to get made, and they're more focused on bigger IP-based temples, which happens to be the subject of this discussion. So that, that I think, is the, you know, the biggest kind of uh, change that I can see. Uh, it seems like Hollywood is looking more and more for films with franchise potential. Um, how has it been for the two of you in terms of trying to get a film made? And when you get in the room and you're talking about something, what are the words that the executives are looking for? Well, I mean, they always want a movie that can last for a couple of movies. They want a franchise. So they want, like, what, are, what is the map for, like, f movies two, three, and four? It's, I guess it's moving more towards what TV is, where you had to go in and pitch several seasons, where now we have to go in and, and pitch an idea that, can, like, this is movie one, this is movie two, or this is the, the roadmap for spin-off movies for it. So, like, with the Lego movie, we're doing the sequels as well as spin-offs at the same time. No, if I can just do a follow-up. When you originally brought that to the studio and you were talking about the Lego movie, in that original conversation, were you already laying out foundation for this? Or did it change based on the box office success? It changed on a, like, based on like, the popularity of certain characters within, th within the, the movie itself, as well as other franchises within the toy brand itself. And so when it first brought it to the studio, it was just more of like, do an original movie uh, just like how they had been doing adaptations of the movies like Star Wars and uh, Harry Potter on the Lego platform, the video games. So it was just a, the original idea was just one original idea. And now it's being spun off to other properties as well as sequels for the original Lego movie. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, the, the whole cliche of, of several years ago about, uh, you know, studios only make big franchises and temples, I mean, that really has now become the... Uh, prevalent uh, reality. I mean, that, that's what they want, most of the big studios. Unless there is a prestige picture that somehow kind of busts through and, uh, and, and you know, uh, you have different kind of producers who've produced those kinds of smaller dramas before. But for the most part, it's all about, you know, if you can create a world for them, if you can create a, a, tran a franchise that has multi-tentacles and then they can use and slate maybe f three, four, five years down the line. I mean, it's really become just about the big picture franchise. For, for both of you, when did you first realize that this franchise t 
moniker, if you will, was becoming so prevalent in the industry? Because it wasn't always like this. Was it a year ago? Was it three years ago? When, when did it sort of all of a sudden hit that this is what everyone is trying to do? It was probably right after the first couple of Marvel movies where the, the, it was always announced that this was their plan and this is how they were going to lay out the universe. And pe people in Hollywood were a little bit skeptical at first, but when that started paying off big for Marvel, that's when all the other studios started to pay attention to that, that, that method of doing movies. It was a well, I mean, Roy is smarter than me, so you know, when he says a little bit skeptical, I, they, everyone at Hollywood, most people were laughing at Marvel. They thought they were going to fall flat on their faces, you know, trying to kind of slate something that far ahead without knowing whether, you know, they were shooting Captain America and Thor before Avengers. Uh, I mean, they were shooting Avengers before Captain America and Thor came out, and that's a risk that most studios wouldn't have taken, but now it's become the kind of model du jour and everyone is following it. So I would say that is when it really became apparent that this is going to be the reality. This is going to be the way studios do business. And every single studio is now implementing that cohesive universe, shared universe, let's slay 10, 12 related pictures over the next six, seven years model, which Marvel started, by the way. Uh, a common complaint from filmgoers when they see non-narrative IPs uh, adapted like Battleship or the Lego movie is that nothing is sacred. Um, what do you say to this criticism? Well, I, I just say, it, like, for me, it's like, what, whatever is a good story, if you could create a good story based on any IP, it's just the story itself that you have to deliver something that the audience wants to see. It doesn't matter if it's based on a toy or if it's based on a comic book or an, an older book. It's like something that the, the screenwriter and the director are going to craft something that's an original story, and it could be based on IP or it could be something else. But it's been working with IP, so that's the way they've been going forward. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I haven't had an experience where, you know, I mean, I've taken a video game and made it into a movie, but I haven't done a, a toy. Can't you, can't you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Let me make sure that... Testing, yeah. one, two, three. Can, yeah. can you hear me? Um, so, yeah, I, I, would, I would assume that, you know, and I was there, if, uh, uh, you know, just, I knew Roy uh, and the other producer, uh, Dan, when they were pushing Lego, and, and I knew how difficult it was for them to, to finally get it made. But, uh, you know, uh, I think with regard to video games, it's the same thing. I mean, you have to see the movie in it before you just make it because it's a, a popular brand. You have to see the story and the concept and see its cinematic potential. Uh, it could be anything. It could be a, you know, uh, I think without that, you have really nothing. It's a, it becomes a cynical exercise and uh, it becomes just a licensing deal. So we don't look at it that way. We look at, you know, if, if there's a good story to tell, if there's characters in the world has potential to be transferred over to a different medium, in this case, movies, feature films. Uh, with, the continue, with the continuing pursuit for established properties to adapt, are you worried that not enough energy is being spent developing, like, one-off pictures? You know, um, for example, you know what I mean? Because it seems like uh, everyone is looking for this franchise potential. Um, how do you, for, how, how, what's the balance like for just creating a solid, good movie versus, you know, looking at the ever long uh, franchises? Well, it depends on whether or not you find a property or a project or a script that is only going to be a one-off movie, and just you have to balance that and whether or not it's worth the time to actually get that pushed through the studio system, because I've heard from studios is like, if you have a $100 million movie that everyone dies at the end and there's no way of doing a sequel, it's going to be a much harder sell for the studio. And, but if you love the script and you want to see it made, you can still push it through if it's a great script and you have the right elements attached. I agree. I mean, I think uh, that's the only way to do those. You have to really uh, have the courage of your conviction, be passionate about it as a producer, and push it through. That it does not comport to the model that the studios are now using. Uh, like, The Revenant is a very rare scenario. Obviously, it has a major movie star in it, and it's a big budget adventure movie. You know, I've, I've heard some people trying to give it a spin that it's a prestige picture. Uh, you know, I guess you could look at it that way, but it's a big adventure movie with a really one of the last remaining movie stars. So unless you have those elements going for it, as Roy said, it takes a lot of passion and conviction because that's not really what studios want to make. You brought it up a second ago, but uh, the studios are all looking for these shared universes. You know, uh, Warner Brothers is DC, uh, Disney is Marvel, uh, Universal is doing the monster movies, um, and now uh, Paramount is combining Transformers with G.I. Joe to be a, you know, a bigger universe. Is this a good thing? Uh, what do you guys think about this shared universe? Well, I, I can't say it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's a, 
it's a thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a reality that every studio has to deal with, and they're doing it in order to survive. Because you look at people's homes, unless you move into their homes and remove the plasma screens and, and disconnect iTunes and VOD on demand and the set-top boxes, they don't want to see dramas and big theaters anymore. So the studios really, for the most part, you know, uh, but so the studios really have to make the, the big movies and, they somehow, and the idea of a connectivity, I think it helps uh, sustain momentum. I mean, look at Marvel again as an example. Every Marvel film is a advertisement for the next one, every single one. I don't think Ant-Man, and this is nothing against the movie, that it was a fine film, but I don't think Ant-Man would have survived without being part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that shared universe slate. So I think that's, that's something that's driving the business of the studios. And it comes down to basically the same thing as before. If it's a good story, it feels original, it doesn't matter if it's part of a shared universe. Uh, so he disagreed with me. That's, that's, <laughs> what, that's, that's what happened. Um, while comic book movies have become the biggest thing at the worldwide box office, uh, I think we can all agree video game movies, or uh, movies based on video games have only scratched the surface right. of box office potential. Um, what is the key for uh, making fans of the games excited for the movie while also uh, appealing to people that have never played the game? Uh, let's start with that. Well, it takes a balance, for sure, to make sure that you appeal to a wide audience who have never played the game. And, and like, in the way I've done it with the projects I'm working on is just include the original IP holders in the creation of the game, itself, of the movie itself, so that you make sure that you have everything you can that appeals to the core gamers, as well as know that they are accepting the, the change that they're made in order to make it a movie. Yeah, I would say that would be the number one problem with video game based movies. I mean, I've made a couple of them and, you know, they've done okay. Uh, I think the biggest problem is not having the creators involved. And, and you know, I mean, Marvel became Marvel once Marvel started making their own movies. And I think the way to do the video game films is, number one, have filmmakers that are passionate about them and know them. Uh, they're fans, they're not just looking at it as a job, but also have the developers and the publishers involved. You know, Roy and I are uh, working on a big video game together, uh, Day of Sex, which is, uh, it's not Day of Sex, it's Do Sex, Day of Sex. It's a pretty big game. And, uh, and, and we can't say where it's going to be because we're still, uh, you know, uh, the deal's still ongoing. But I can tell you that the video game company, the developers are going to be involved from, from A to Z. And, and we're talking about doing a lot of different stuff with them, which I can't get into. Uh, but, you know, the, it's not going to be made in a vacuum and it's not going to be made, you know, um, you know, by a bunch of people who just, you know, license the rights and go off and make the movie and hold them at bay. They're going to be very involved. And I, truly believe that is the only way for video game films to become the next whatever they're going to be. I happen to think they're going to be the next comic book movies. I haven't been proven right yet, but I feel if you, 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 know, you have more filmmakers who are passionate and have a lot of power, producers, directors, writers, that get them in conjunction with the video game people working on them together, I think you're going to see that. And I think Assassin's Creed hopefully will be the first one. I well, really do. Well, this is actually a huge year for video game movies. Uh, we have Warcraft and we have Assassin's Creed. That's right, Warcraft. And those are two huge uh, potentials at the box office. Do you think both of those, just from you guys, you're not involved in either. Do you, what do you guys think about both this year? Uh, do you think these are going to cross over? Well, I haven't seen either one, so it's hard to say. But like, they both have the potential because they have a huge audience in terms of the video game audience as well as uh, just like the budget that makes it feel like an event for them, for the audience to go to. So uh, without seeing the movie, I can't say if, because it's going to depend on how good the movie is. Like if they do a great movie, then it's going to be huge for everyone. I agree. Uh, what do you think video game companies can do to foster better adaptations and make video game adaptations as big as comic book movies or any other huge genre out of Hollywood? Well, I mean, we touched upon it a little bit before. I mean, they need to be involved. They need to, uh, uh, and they want to be involved. I, I, have, I have yet to talk to a publisher or a developer who doesn't want to be involved in the... I have one. You have one? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I wanted to do uh, something on, of uh, Under, uh, what was that, the game? Undertale. And uh, they, they had no interest whatsoever. Well, that's interesting. That's, a, that's rare. Yeah. But uh, I think the, the, the more they're, they're involved, I think the, the better your chances of are pleasing the core audience. I mean, I've gone through an uh, uh, example where the core audience, for whatever reason, just felt that this, their 
their game wasn't being treated with proper respect, which is which, respectfully, they were wrong. But regardless, that's how they felt, and their knives were sharp, and and they went to work on us on social media. And that's the reason I bring that up is uh, you know the uh, the gentleman before us was here talking about you know that kind of the world. It, it's it's imperative, especially with video games, because the fans are cross over to people who are very active on social media. So you want to get them on your side. And I think the truer you are to the core DNA, still has to, you have to make a good story, you have to make a good movie, you know, and, and making a movie is different than making a video game, but you need to have them involved in terms of constructing the world. And, and I think uh, if you do that, and hopefully you make a good movie, I think you should be fine. I'm of the minority that when I see a movie that changes a costume, say we're talking about whatever comic book character there is, and in the book it's someone in black leather, and in the movie they make it red. <laughs> For me, I don't care because I understand that this is a movie, it, it might be different. For the two of you, it does seem like there is a huge group of fans that the minute you make a change, they are you know, off the rails, angry, and they just they can't see that the movie might, you know, has, maybe has to do something a little bit differently. How do you balance with those kinds of fans and the diehards that are, you know, so... With Restraining the orders. No, <laughs> no, it's, it's a joke, it's a joke. Yeah. Look, I mean, I went through it again. I mean, on, on, on Hitman Agent 47, we, had, we decided that Agent 47 should have a stubble, not completely shaved, and we got, we got killed for it. So, yeah, I mean, he, has a, you know, he looks like Agent 47, but, you know, and again, it, and I respect that. I, I know where they're coming from, but you, you have to just, you know, you can't, you got to, look, again, it goes back to the first thing he said. You have to make a great movie. You have to make a good movie at the very least. You can't worry about everything else. But, you know, the more you can pay respect or be respectful to the DNA of the uh, property and have a group of people around you who understand it, who share your vision for it, not just trying to make a movie and get a fee, I think you're going to do okay. Uh, right now, I'm sure the flavor of the moment changes all the time in Hollywood, but what is the flavor of the moment when you walk into rooms? Is there something that everyone's looking for right now? All of his projects. <laughs> no. It's, it's usually just the, the biggest IP that has the, the biggest awareness worldwide and so like things like Minecraft was very important to them or things like uh, actually I don't want to say some of the other things that I'm in the middle of working on but like think big IP that the, the studio knows that just announcing just like for them it's like if you put out a title of a movie that has no social relevance you have to spend a lot of effort to explain to the audience what that movie is but like you put a title out there let's say Minecraft, the movie, people will know ex not exactly what the story is, but they'll know essentially what the world will be like. Uh, what is the golden goose of franchise opportunities that you both would love to have, uh, like a Star Wars? Do you have like a dream project that you've always been going after? Well, how do we know if we say it here, these nice people are not going to go after it? Uh, you don't. Well, mine is uh, Nintendo. I think it's like Zelda, Mario, the, the whole universe of characters I feel like could be perfect for like a Lego movie type movie with the Nintendo movie, with that whole universe. I don't have the rights to it. I, I would love to, but that's my holy grail. Mine is something that he also likes, Calvin and Hobbes. Ooh, yeah. Which I think would be just extraordinary. A part of me also feels like maybe nobody should make it into a movie. You know, maybe, maybe it's best in its the current format, but it would be that. It is interesting. I think I've heard rumblings, and maybe you guys have too, that Nintendo is getting ready to mine some other IP for something. In the, you know, they've finally started warming up to the idea, and they're sitting on a gold mine of, I mean, Mario and Zelda alone. I mean, look at what's happening with Disney. I mean, Disney is easily the, the, the biggest entertainment company in the world now because of, you know, they kind of had the, uh, uh, the vision that they saw where the future was going in, 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 in not only just movies, in all of entertainment and media. I mean, they own Marvel, they own Star Wars. I mean, Nintendo, these characters that they own, they, they, you know, they have a deep, deep fan base, and they're beloved. So all you need to do is just execute them. And if you execute them right, I think you can have gigantic, the sky's the limit, I really believe that. I think for everyone in the audience and everyone watching, uh, they're going to be curious how an, a movie actually gets made through the studio system. You recently made a lot hit of bribes, right? Uh, you recently made uh, Hitman at Fox, and you made Lego at uh, Warner Brothers. Can you describe a little bit of the behind-the-scenes process of uh, getting a movie made, and maybe what people would be surprised to learn? Roy, you go first. Well, for this one, it's always 
the process of like identifying the property first and deciding like what direction you want to go with the movie. And that process can take a long time because you have to go through different iterations with maybe like you, you hear 20 or so different pitches from different writers to sort of decide which way you want to go with it or just like you'll learn something new of the, that you wouldn't think, think about. And so from there, you, you have to develop the script. And it could take, I've developed scripts for over 10 years because it just like, it just doesn't work out right or it just feels like it's not a movie yet. And then at the point when it feels like the studio's willing to back it, you go out to a director and you put together a cast with the director and then the studio decides whether or not they're gonna green light it. I mean, that, that's basically the process of every movie whether or not it's video games or it's a, it's a book or because like you have to, in, an, in a, like if you take a book, you have to decide what you're going to keep in and cut out and the writer would be the one that makes that decision. If I can ask a follow-up, um, when you, you, people, you say the studio, is there a point contact? Like is there one development person you're always working with? Is it a team? Could you describe a little bit of the internal workings? Because everyone was going to hear Warner Brothers and Lego, but they're not going to know how it really moves through the process. It's a team of executives as well as uh, the head of the studio who make the decisions on whether or not, after reading the script, whether they want to go forward with it. And they also are involved with the, the choices before the script's written, of like how the movie should be, what audience they want to try to target. So it's, uh, it, it depends. Independent films are much different. I mean, I I've mainly work on studio films, um, so that, that's the way I, I've worked with it. What are you looking at me for? I never made an independent movie. Okay. Uh, you know, same thing he said. Look, Hitman in particular was five years of developing it, hearing different pitches, a lot of false starts. You know, you kind of have to get lucky. I hate to bring luck into anything, but, you know, that's kind of the name of the game sometimes. And, and then we got our director, and then we got our actor, and then we had another false start. Uh, so I think it took about six years to, to get the last one made. And once, and you deal with a team of execs, and once the film becomes real where, you know, the studio has to put up or shut up, uh, then the, you know, the head of the studio gets involved, and then you have to kind of uh, get his or her blessing. And then you have a series of other meetings and address a bunch of other notes. And I think, it, you know, I, it's funny about movies. Movies just get made. I, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe you've made more movies than I have, so you probably have a different experience of, or more of a comprehensive experience. But for me, it, it, they just get made. You don't even know. One day you just know that your line producer is, uh, is got a team and their offices and somehow it's just the machine is starting to move forward. And then when you kind of a, take a break and look back at what got it there, you're horrified and you have nightmares about it for the rest of your life. But it, it, it really it becomes this kind of a um, organic, amorphous process. And then just one day the movie is and you're on a set. But, you know, it, the process of getting it to that point is exactly like what he said. But now it's a little different, it feels, than when I first started the business, where it is like, once we identify an IP, they would give us a target date to, to that they want to release the movie. And so we sort of have to work backwards and quickly and, and, and put together the movie in, in the way that we can to fit that date. So before it's like, let's just develop a lot of properties and see which one bubbles up is the, the, the script that works out the best. Now it's like we identify it, we, they give us a date, and we, if we make it, great. But if it looks like it's being derailed for some reason, then they'll put another film in there that they have already have their eye on that date as well. So it's almost like you're competing with other people for specific slots. Uh, I actually prefer that, by the way. I actually prefer having a, having a release date and working. A lot of people hate it, but I think it's the, it's, it, to me it feels like real work. You have a release date and you just have to back into it. Well, I think a lot of people aren't going to realize that the reason why you hear like a Ridley Scott attach himself to eight different movies and he's you know, developing all these things is that it's really hard to get the green light. You know, it's really hard to m get that movie made, and if you have a release date, that means they're really serious. I love, I love having release dates. I think it's the best thing. Uh, what advice would you give to people who are trying to uh, get a movie made? And what maybe... Talk to him. <laughs> what, and what have you learned, or uh, uh, what do you wish someone had told you at the beginning of your career, uh, or even last year, that you've been able to apply, you know, or wish you, you know, that kind of advice? You go first. Advice. Well, if, for me, it's, it's like... I, it's really hard because to say that because I, I, it's, it, I don't think I had any specific plan to go make certain movies. It's like, it's a lot of it's luck and you just have to trust your instinct on things that you think are gonna work. And uh, 
that's the only thing, the advice I could give because I, I can't tell you that I knew The Departed was gonna be a huge movie or when I first set it up or the Lego movie was gonna work. I mean, I've had movies that I was so sure that were gonna be huge hits that I can never get made. So it's really difficult to give advice that way. It's just you have to trust your instinct and just keep on pushing on the project you believe in. Trust your instincts and, and, and if you believe in a project, do not give up. Uh, under any circumstances, you know, uh, you know, uh, I have a project at Warner Brothers with a friend of ours, a good friend of ours, Dan Lin, uh, called Johnny Quest, and uh, Dan and I have been pushing it for I think seven years, and we love it. Uh, you know, we, it's a multi-generational property. You know, uh, yeah, there it is. Oh, yeah. People love it, uh, but but it's been for a variety of reasons. We have a great script, but for a variety of reasons, it's been a challenge. And the reason we've pushed it, I mean, we're both busy uh, because we believe in it. The, we, 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 it's, even if it takes another 10 years, it's worth getting Johnny Quest made. So, you know, as a producer, especially now, I think you have to be, you have to be uh, really, really convic convinced of your own uh, uh, taste, and, and you have to hang in there and push it through. It's interesting with Johnny. No other Qu choice. It's interesting with Johnny Quest though, because this is an IP that's been around for a very long time. Fifty years, fifty-three years. And it's interesting to see that even with an IP like that, with name recognition, it's still a challenge. It, it, it's bizarre to me, but uh, but you know now we're getting a lot of traction and studios is, is getting behind it. But it took about you know I think eight and a half, eight years, honestly. You know. Um, I want to do a follow up on The Departed, which is a movie that I absolutely love, and I would imagine everyone who's seen it loves it. There was talk about, uh, that was a great one-off, but then there was talk about doing like a prequel or a sequel. How serious did that conversation ever get? It got pre pretty serious, I mean, because the original movie was based on a trilogy, and so we had a take for the sequel that the only reason why it didn't go forward was because some of the people involved did not want it going forward. And so like there, there's people in Hollywood who if you have enough power, you could actually, if you, if you just say you don't want something, Spielberg is like that as well. If he just doesn't want something happening, it won't happen. So it's, uh, that was the thing. But we are planning on doing a adaptation uh, potentially for a TV eventually. Well, that could be interesting. Uh, social media is more important than ever. The gentleman who was on stage before us was demonstrating the importance of social media, and, and, and I would agree with it. I think that you look at the box office of, say, a Deadpool over the weekend, and I've seen over the last year the importance of pe normal people's reaction to a movie that on Friday, if general audiences you know, see it and then they love it, the, the box office on Saturday and Sunday goes up higher than the projections based purely on word of mouth. Uh, for both of you, how have you seen social media uh, playing with uh, and interacting with Hollywood, and do you both have a favorite format? Well, are there any Patriot fans here? Okay, good, because I hate the Patriots, but uh, <laughs> I mean, that's right, you're a Patriots fan. No, the reason, I, the reason I brought that up is that, you know, you said, do you have any regrets about the, <laughs> yeah, I have, I have a lot of regrets about going after the Patriots coach, the owner, the players on Twitter, but you know, outside of that, uh, you know, I use Facebook mainly to promote my endeavors in business, and I use Twitter to mainly vent. And I've learned that you really can't do that with a person in my position, because you might piss somebody off that, you know, could get your movie made or help you. So, but I, I never go after anyone personally, by the way. I just, just Robert Kraft. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, is, do I have a, do I, do I have a favorite? I'm talking about like for, for movies, like for Hitman. Did you do anything special? You did. Fox did one of the most uh, you know, unique and original campaigns that I had seen in a long time. It was called 47 Days of Hitman, which they started 47 days prior to the North American launch. And every day they had brand new content uh, on social media, whether it was a poster or it was a famous graffiti artist doing a rendering of Agent 47 or a, 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 you know, uh, a musician or another kind of a YouTube celebrity. So I thought that was, that was very interesting. It actually opened my eye uh, with regard to, because I wasn't really, you know, how, how effective is social media? How much can you monetize it? But, you know, I thought they did a really good job with that. And then Deadpool has just been, I think that's been kind of fruition of the vision that they had. I mean, uh, it's, it, it's extraordinary. I mean, you know, Deadpool is not Spider-Man and it's not Superman, but look at the opening. And now it's probably the most famous superhero in the world. I think social media was a big part of that 
campaign going back to last Comic Con after they showed the trailer. I would agree. I'm a bit of a Luddite. I don't use any social media. I mean, for, for the movies that I work on, there's experts at the studio in the marketing that, that handle that. I primarily focus on the back end, early development, working on the story and the script of the movies. So it's hard for me to, to get that involved in something. Because I, whenever I do something, I want to go all in. And I think I get so obsessed with it that I would, uh, it would take away from my time and the, the, the things that I know I can do right now. We're almost out of time, um, so I'm going to ask, I believe, one more question. I'm sure both of you were offered a lot of scripts. Uh, he gets offered more than I do, though. I believe you were probably offered uh, an awful lot of scripts. Uh, and for both, but both, for both of you, how do you decide what you want to work on, and how do you find that needle in the haystack because there are so many scripts out there? It's, you just have to read a lot and just hear different pitches, and you just go with your gut and things. For me, it's always just developing things that I would go see myself. I mean, it's like it's hard for me to develop something that if it, it's a movie that like even if it was in the theaters, I, I would not go to it. But if like there's a certain movie and it, like I see a trailer in my own head, and I would go see that movie, that's when I know I would want to develop it. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, we got into this business because. You know, we're, we're the audience, and, 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 you know, uh, and I think you have to, you, whenever you read a script or you play a video game or read a comic book or a book or whatever, uh, the, the source material that you want to use uh, as the basis for your project, I think you have to be passionate about it and you have to want to see it on the big screen. I, I can't, I, I've tried to play other people's games and read a horror script and, uh, I mean, he, he's great with horror, I, I, I don't get it, but I, people sent me, a, you know, an agent would send me a script saying, this is going to go out next week. It's a hot horror spec. Read it. You know, part of you says, okay, if I say I like it, it goes out and it gets made, and you know, I'm a producer on it. But then when you read it, you just, my heart is not in it. And it's so tough making a movie that you only want to do the stuff that your, your heart is in that you can actually see through and, and get made. Otherwise, I think it just becomes a fruit, you know, fruitless exercise, at least for me. Uh, my last question for the two of you. Uh, you guys are working on a number of upcoming projects. Uh, how did you guys first connect? And what is the secret to uh, working together in Hollywood where there is, I'm going to use the term, a number of egos? Well, it, it's just like you, you, just the same way you make friends in your life. It's just like you, you meet with them, you feel like you connect with them, and you can work with them, and you trust them, then it, it, it's very easy. And so it's the, the relationships that you develop over the number of years that after like, dipping your toe in developing projects, you know the people that you can connect with. Uh, as, as to how we met, our mutual friend Dan Lynn introduced us. And, uh, and then we kind of hit it off from that you know, first drinks that we had at the Larmitage, I believe. And, uh, you know, for me, you know, Roy is such a, I mean, Roy is very understated and very, he's, you know, this guy is unbelievable. I mean, I marvel at how, what he does and how he does it every day. So I've learned a lot from him. But the most important thing for me is that I trust him, 100%. And I believe he trusts me, both creatively and, and business-wise. And, you know, I think our personalities, as you can tell, are, are a little different, so we don't, step over each other's toes. I think we complement each other. But the main thing for me is that I, he's got unbelievable creative instincts, great taste, and I trust him. And I think you're very lucky to find someone in this business to be able to trust, because no project is really worth it, for me at least, because I, I hold our friendship more important. And that actually ends up being a, uh, a good thing, because I think it helps the business relationship part of it as well. What do you, can you tease people what you guys are working on together? We're doing those deus ex together and another project which I can't mention, because I think people that, some people involved with the company are here, but uh, uh, we, they, we were, we, we, Deus Ex was at CBS Films, we took it out, they're great, they were awesome partners, but you know, they, they can't make movies beyond a certain budget, or at least don't have the desire to, I shouldn't say can't, because I don't work at CBS Films, and now we're in the, hopefully the last lap of announcing it at a major studio, so we're very excited about that, and as I said earlier, we wanna, we're gonna be working very close with Square Enix and IDOS Montreal to hopefully create something special. Cool. I'm going to say thank you both so much for uh, being at Dice with me. And uh, thank you. I think people here are having lunch or doing something else soon.